All right, what's going on, everybody? Uh, my name is Jake, as you all know, and I'm here to talk to you about the latest and greatest and hottest thing in the development community. It is called Webpack. And what we do with it, which we've been doing for the past two months with React, is bundle our modules. So I'm here to explain to you what the hell that all means and what's so cool about the tool we've been using for two months and know just about nothing about. Um, it's presence in our build system and in our web app in general to deliver it to its form in which we can operate in the front end is extremely important and its usefulness goes far beyond what we've seen already. So, much like Neil deGrasse Tyson, I plan to take you on a journey through space and time. <laughs> Not that dramatic, but seriously, the Webpack ecosystem is huge. It is a universe in itself, so I want the context set to be we're going to explore a very small microcosm of what exists uh, within the capabilities that Webpack provides. So at its Simplest, we can look at the first small sentence. Webpack is a module bundler. Module bundler, say that five times fast. But it also supports things like pre processing, code splitting, request caching, automatic reloading for development, and I could go on literally talking for 10 minutes just with its features. So that's what makes Webpack so cool. Uh, but what makes it really cool is that it's so lightweight, the only thing you need to use is the module bundler. So in its simplest form, if you take away one thing from this talk, the thing to take away would be that Webpack allows us to create static assets that end users of our applications the client can consume. Pretty simple at that, but we'll go into some of the cool stuff as well. So all that aside, I think whenever we use a new tool or we use any tool at all, we have to ask ourselves, why are we using this tool in the first place? What is so important about it? What problems is it actually solving for us? Um, I'd argue that Webpack solves a litany of problems, but we can kind of drum it up into three higher level problems. The first one is that front end development work is often very repetitive, especially when we're preparing our code for production. There's many things that we might need to do with it. For instance, we might need to deduplicate certain assets within our JavaScript code. We might need to minify it so that it's quicker to deliver to the client. We might need to pre-process things like turn our JSX into JS code. These are all things that are very repetitive. We'll have to do them every time we're working the front end. We make updates, and we want to test again. So we have these things called task runners. Uh, task runners are a system like Grunt, that little cute little warhog in the middle. Uh, we have Gulp over here. Those are two of the premier JavaScript task running systems, and they were built to alleviate that pain. They were built so that you could automate these tasks. Um, and introduce the concept of a plugin system where you can do all sorts of fun stuff like minification, duplication, um, and a bunch of cool stuff. So what does Task Runner do? It makes our life easier as front end developers. Um, number two, when building a production single page application, I think the number one thing to take away is that we have a lot of code to deliver to the client side, especially on initial load. What bundling allows us to do is to create a single or just a couple of JavaScript files out of the tens or maybe hundreds of JavaScript files that we have to actually operate our application when we're building a React app. If you think of all the component uh, files, if you think about all the container files, the Redux files, all those files, we don't want to deliver those single-handedly to the browser because that's going to be a lot of round trips back and forth between the client and the server. So bundlers help us crawl what we call the dependency graph, which I'll be talking about a little bit, and it creates one single file for us. Really cool. Try doing that by hand. I dare you to do that. Um, another really cool thing that Webpack introduced and has been picked up by a bunch of other bundling systems in the meantime is that it will actually go through your dependency graph with just about any module style that you want. So AMD, the common JS style you see in Node.js, new ES6 modules, Webpack will handle all of those. So by using Webpack, you can do just about any type of JavaScript development you really want. Uh, and the number one coolest thing, which probably won't come through in this talk, but if you talk to some real geeks about uh, what is Webpack cool for, Ben said it himself, CSS modules. Uh, not just CSS modules, but anything could be a module. A PNG, an SVG, CSS file, anything in Webpack can be a module. You'll see why that is really cool in a little bit. Uh, the third thing is that scalable web apps, when you talk about serving millions and millions of users, it's very important that we are efficient with our content delivery. So bundling can only do so much by downsizing your file, uh, your files into one single file or two files. Um, what Webpack can also help you do is selectively cache portions of your code 
things like vendor libraries, which are not going to change over the course of development, and put them into separate files dynamically. It'll also chunk your application code up so you can load stuff on demand as users load separate pages, they navigate to certain parts of the page, something called lazy loading. There's so many things that Webpack can do that alleviate you as a developer from thinking about them at all, but you can still take advantage of them. So the three main use cases and why we use Webpack, task running, module building, chunking and caching. I'm sure someone out there can uh, stump me on that and provide many other reasons, but those are mine. So let's give it a start. Uh, we're not going to do any live coding just yet, but I'm going to walk through four use cases from basic to intermediate, and we'll see what exactly is actually going on within our Webpack config so that we understand how we're delivering our code. Uh, we'll get to React code, but delivering it from the code that we write to the code that ultimately is delivered to the client. So we're going to start off with the simplest of front-end files. It's simply a index.js file, and it says, hello world to the log. Easy. Um, I think you know, that should be pretty simple and straightforward. So uh, how do we actually get that onto, uh, in our public folder so that the client can consume it from their index.html file? Well, you'll see inside our webpack.config, we have literally two variables, or one object which has two parameters. The first one, entry. So entry tells Webpack where to start into and start the dependency graph off on. So we tell Webpack, hey, go into our source file and find the index.js file. That is this guy right here, prints a little cute little hello world message to the screen. And we're going to say, once you get that, you're going to go ahead and bundle all the modules, which really there's only one here. And you're going to bundle it into the public folder. And you're going to bundle it into a file called bundle.js. And what happens is you get this output. So this is going to be the output in the console. And it's going to say, OK, as Webpack, we looked at all your files. I crawled the dependency graph. I found one lonely little index.js file over here. And I bundled it into something called bundle.js. Super small. There's really nothing in there. But at the end of the day, it did everything for you. If you look in the file, it's very lightweight. Um, and it did its job. So nothing special there. But we kind of showed you the mystery of what is that entry and output parameter within our Webpack config. Next, keep remembering, everything is a module, and you're always building a bundled module. So everything's a module. Oprah, you get a module, you get a module, you get a module. Remember that. Here's a little bit of a more complex situation. Still pretty simple. We have two files in this situation. The first one, the root of our dependency graph, is going to be index.js. And it's still going to say, uh, going to print a console log. But where it's going to get that log is from a function within a file called message.js. And that message.js is being required by index.js. So what's going to happen is when we give Webpack our entry point, which is still index.js, it's going to say, oh, OK, I see that index requires message. So we're also going to bundle that all in together. The message simply has an export of hello. So we're going to get the same exact output here within our web app, but it's a little bit more for Webpack to handle. But no problem for Webpack. It's still pretty simple. We didn't have to change the config at all. But now you can see Webpack actually bundled two dependencies into one bundle. Still bundle.js. It's grown about 0.2 kilobytes, not too much. But Webpack did it all for us. Didn't have to really tell it anything complex. That is just about as simple as it gets. But we can get a lot more complex if we want. We can handle multiple entry points for model, mod, module bundling. And we can also handle multiple exit points, so bundling into separate models. And we'll show you the real basis of that in a little bit. Now, the example you've been waiting for, how the hell does React app get built? Um, and this is where we start to add on some really cool features that are provided by the task running capabilities of Webpack. So still two files here, nothing too complex. We're going to uh, create an entry point of index.js again down here. But index.js actually requires a bunch of other stuff. So it's going to import React. It's going to import render from the React DOM. So we have two vendor dependencies right now, which is a lot of code. Uh, and then it imports our one component, which is app. So it's going to crawl this entire dependency tree into React and all its components, into render all its modules, into app. All app's going to do, it's going to pass this back to hello world. So we've advanced to, from printing to the screen. And now we're actually going to uh, create an element and paint it onto the canvas onto the document. So what does that config look like? Well, we've added a couple things here. Um, you can see that our entry point is still the same. Our exit point is still the same. But we've added in some additional capabilities. 
uh, greatest of which are these loaders. What loaders help us do, um, among many other things, are pre-process pre our files. So maybe the most basic example I could give you, if you've heard of CoffeeScript, kind of a um, nice, clean way of writing JavaScript, we can take CoffeeScript and pre-process it, transpile it, as some of you may know, into JavaScript. Uh, more complex way, but the way which we all use today uh, as developing React applications is going to be using Babel to go ahead and Babelify our code and turn it into pretty vanilla JS5 code from JSX. So this loader right here, that's going to do all that. That's literally all the code you have to write to say any JSX files uh, specified with that regex over there, that JSX question mark dollar sign, find those, convert them into simple ES5. And we have one other thing. We're going to introduce the concept of plugins. Plugins are really neat. If you think about loaders as things that handle conversions of files to other type of files, plugins can do just about anything. Um, but the coolest things they do is they'll change your code. So if we introduce concept that Stephanie was talking about, you can have uh, like ASI. You can find semicolons missing from your code. You can insert them. In this case, it's going to minify our code. So our output is going to be the exact same. We still have one bundle, but it has grown inside a bunch, 220 kilobytes. Uh, and it has 173 modules. So those were all brought in by React. But we barely wrote any more code. Webpack handled all that bundling, all the, that build. So really, when it comes down to it, we rely on Webpack to take all of our dependencies and crunch it down into a single file that we deliver to the client. It greatly minimizes the amount of code that we send to the client. And if you think about that minification that we did, um, it's a much smaller size as well. And we barely had to do anything as a Webpack consumer. Now, the coolest thing, which I'm going to have to really rush through and hope you can take this up on your own time, is code splitting. Uh, so why would we want to ever code split? Well, I'll give you the simplest example. Um, say we have a bunch of dependencies that are required on the front end but that never changed. So take React, take React DOM, take Redux. We're never going to change the code of Redux ourselves, but we're always going to need it. So if we could, why don't we create two separate entry points into our application, one with our vendor dependencies, so same application in this case, and one with our index, our app code. And we're going to output them in such a way that we're going to identify them specifically for each build. And that's the concept of hashing, hashing such that Every time uh, we update our code, our vendor chunk is not, our vendor bundle, it's not going to change. It's going to be the same because we have not changed our vendor dependencies. But our application code will, meaning that when our client reloads a page, it is not going to go ahead and reload the new, the vendor dependencies. It's only going to reload our application dependencies. So why is that important? And that's all using the common chunks plugin. Well, it's important because we look at the output over here. Our application code is now 400 bytes versus the vendor code, which is 200 kilobytes. That might not seem like a lot, but when you're talking about retrieving from across the world, it, it, it really minimizes the amount of time that it takes our client to go ahead and retrieve our application code versus the vendor code, which they don't have to go and grab multiple times. So for production setups, this is huge. And the amount of code, again, that I had to write was almost minimal. So again, I promised you guys it wasn't sexy. But it is one of the most important things we can learn as React developers, especially as we go towards pushing our applications to production. So takeaways from this talk and for Webpack in general, um, it is far and away the most popular build tool used by React developers. Um, it is advocated for by the pretty much the lead developers on Redux, React, and that entire ecosystem. So learn to love it because it is most likely here to stay. Um, it is very powerful, but as uh, Uncle Ben said, with great power comes great responsibility. And it is very heavy on configuration in that manner. So it is not user friendly. It's very hard and difficult for beginners, which is why the Create React app repo was created by some of the Facebook people to provide a boilerplate and a nice abstraction. I think it's a nice way of getting started with Webpack. And once you're comfortable with the features there, you can learn what's under the covers and what's actually going on. Uh, and the reality is, most of the advanced features are not necessary outside of production. So you don't have to know 75% of it until you really have to start thinking about performance gains and scalability of your application. Uh, and the other 25%, I don't think is too difficult. And I know everybody here is more than smart enough to learn them. So let's get on that. Webpack, so hot right now. Webpack. And it really is. You talk to any developer who's been in the front end space, and they see so much potential in Webpack. 
I have added here a bunch of helpful sources, understanding the importance of task runners, uh, module bunders in general, the documentation, as well as a repository with all the code samples, which I went over today. So you can try those out, see the basics. Uh, I think it's really important to learn. And if you have time, go through this. Uh, and then after all, there's really cool plugins out there that I think are useful for checking out, especially as an intro to the ecosystem. So that's Webpack. Go out and learn it. And thanks for letting me talk.